very good evening guys welcome to the platform of an academy so myself i am dr ramneshri i teach chopsticks and gynecology very good morning very good evening i hope i am audible and visible to all of you so now we start with the session and uh, let me give a brief this in introduction about the platform of an academy so you have to use unlike unlock 20 to unlock 20% of all the an academy subscriptions so this offer is uh, exclusive for jan 30 and 31st and you can use the code of ramya live for further 20% discount guys so you can use the code of ramya live for further 10% discount so on this 20% you are going to get another 10% so you almost have 30% discount guys so utilize this uh, benefit of uh, and this is offer is exclusive for 30 and 31st i think you should utilize this right very good evening julie good evening nana so you have plus subscription where you can access both live and recorded classes you can study on the device of your choice you have an academy or plus prep lider iconic subscription there are fmg toppers the there are tests curated test series uh, exclusive so you can utilize these also guys on the an academy we also have special classes guys so in special classes uh, we have interactive sessions i you can speak to me there will be polls where you can answer so it is like you know a uh, quiz so that's a very good uh, uh, thing right there's a highly curated question bank which you can utilize you can raise your hand and speak to me there are many batches which are newly designed for you you have neat pg ultra fast revision batch target next batch target next subject wise batch neat pg 2022 high high yield mcq batch you have focus fmg batch you have ultra fast revision batch so these are the our prizes okay let's start with the session let's start with the session a 35 year old primary gravida at 32 weeks of gestation she comes to the opd with second episode of reduced fetal movements initial examination and ctg is normal what should be your next step so she has come to you with second episode she has come to you with second episode very good so when a one episode of decreased fetal movements you have to do uh, nst but they have come to you with second episode you should always go with the ultrasound scan you should always go with the ultrasound scan ideally you should do biophysical profile who can quickly tell me all the components of biophysical profile guys so what are the components of biophysical profile who can quickly tell me the components of biophysical profile yes dr kasto very good so you can remember with the mnemonic uh, so my mnemonic for the biophysical profile is ban mo2 ban mo2 so b stands for breathing yes so a stands for afi n stands for non stress test mo stands for movements to stands for tone now among these among these which is the 
uh, which is the first to disappear whenever you have the hypoxia which is the first to disappear when you have hypoxia So first to disappear will be the NST because this is the last to appear. So whenever you have hypoxia, first to become abnormal is NST, non-stress test because non-stress test mainly measures the autonomic nervous system activity. Non-stress test mainly measures the ANS activity and ANS activity develops around 28 weeks. So whenever you have hypoxia, the first to disappear is the ANS or uh, NST and the last to disappear is tone, tone. Yes, even I am feeling the screen is blurred. I don't know why. Just one minute guys, I'm just checking why the screen is blurred. <coughs> right. So last to disappear is the tone because in tone we have the uh, tone is the first to appear because tone is the first to appear, right? And all this you have to check with the help of uh, ultrasound. So as you take ultrasound help to check all this, uh, as you take ultrasound to check all the, uh, uh, you have to do the ultrasound almost for 30 minutes to check for all the components of biophysical profile. So it is very time taking and NST will take 20 minutes. So it's a one hour test to do NST plus uh, all those things of the uh, biophysical profile. So that is why we also have something called as modified biophysical profile. So what is modified biophysical profile? What are the components of modified biophysical profile? So what are the components of modified biophysical profile? So modified biophysical profile is AFI plus NST. AFI plus NST. Okay. So this is time saving. This is time saving. Next question. A 40 years old smoker obese, three previous LSCS, family is complete, seeks permanent effective contraception, partner is refusing to take contraception. So what is the contraception which you want to give for the woman when she has all these complications? Understand her complications guys. She is 40 years old. So 40 years old woman. She is a smoker. She is obese. BMI of 40. She has three previous LSCS. She has come to you for permanent effective contraception. See, ideally with all these complications, I will tell go ask your partner to get vasectomy done. Hey, no. But you see here, the partner is telling no, no, he doesn't want to take. So you want to again advise the woman itself. So I am waiting for a correct answer now. Wonderful, Ruksar. Uh, Ruksar, can you tell why did you choose? So, first and foremost, I am going to rule out copper tea, guys. I am not going to use copper tea here in this patient. Why am I not going to use copper tea in this patient? 
First, I'll remove copper T from this question. Why we are ruling out the copper T? Because copper T is not perm. Is 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 copper T a permanent contraception? So copper T is contra and copper T is not permanent. It is a temporary method. It's a temporary method. Right? And uh, copper T comes under the category of LARC guys. That is long acting reversible contraceptive. Copper T comes under the category of LARC. Long acting reversible contraceptive. Uh, so these are going to be effective for long time. But as soon as you remove, they'll get back the contraception. So they're reversible. So here they're asking permanent. So I'm not going to use copper T. That is point number one. Okay. Now coming to the next step. Pomeroy is a method where you where we do mini laparotomy. So you have to do mini laparotomy for Pomeroy. Previous three LSCS. What do you think if you open the abdomen? How will be the how will be inside the abdomen? Will it be a cakewalk or a katra walk or a scary walk inside? So everything might be adherent to each other. Everything might be adherent to each other. So, it is very difficult to do mini laparotomy also here because she has three previous LSEs. Yes, excellent. Very good, Ruxar. So, laparoscopy I can't do because I'm scared there might be multiple adhesions. Next, I would not prefer to do another important issue because she is 40 BMI. So, obesity. There are two contraindications for me to perform. It's not like an absolute contraindication, but yes, it will be difficult. So, I can do hysteroscopic sterilization here. What is the method of hysteroscopic sterilization which you know? So, it's a wonderful question actually. It's a wonderful question which requires your thinking ability, which improves the thinking ability. This, these are some patterns where you have to learn uh, clinically how you have to manage, right? Again, uh, at uh, 9 p.m. also, I'm having a session on the an academy app guys at 9 p.m. on the an academy app i'm doing pyqs previous year questions so that is absolutely uh, free again free there are special classes yes you will do assure So in Azure, you are going to push the micro coil inside the fallopian tube. So in Azure, you are going to push the micro coil inside the fallopian tube. So what is this micro coil? So, this micro coil is made up of nickel and titanium. So, the advantage of hysteroscopic sterilization in this patient is as she is previous 3 LSEs and obese, I am not going to open the abdomen. I am going to go through the, through the cervix and then through the uterus and then into the fallopian tube and going to instill these coils. So, yes, they are made up of nickel and titanium alloy. Nicotinol. And this will cause fibrosis of the fallopian tube in three months. So this will lead to the fibrosis of the fallopian tube in three months. So up to three months they require alternative contraception. <coughs> so next question guys. A 24-year-old, strong family history of ovarian cancer with proven BRCA genetic mutation has one child and is planning to have bilateral oophorectomy following the birth of second child. 
she sees she seeks effective contraception that would be beneficial to her long term health so what is a contraceptive which you want to give her which will help her in her long term health also as well as as well as it will benefit her from uh, her ovarian cancer also so here most of you are answering d but how does copper tea help in uh, pre, uh, help in uh, her ovarian cancer yeah see all of this can give you the benefit of uh, 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 contraception but any uh, any specific contraception which will help in her long term health uh, very good kasturb and vignesh so why do you think uh, b is the answer can you tell me the reason why do you think b is the answer so here the answer is combined oral contraceptive pills so a 24 year old strong family history of ovarian cancer with proven braca genetic mutation has one child and is planning to have bilateral oophorectomy following the birth of second child they seek effective contraception that would be beneficial to her long term health right so now uh, uh, why are they seeking the effective contraception uh, here we prefer combined oral contraceptive pills because ocps are also protective for ovarian cancer why ocps are protective for ovarian cancer because they prevent ovulation and uh, what does what does the uh, why do we have ovarian cancer ovarian cancer is mainly because of repeated ovulation so as this patient has high risk of getting ovarian cancer till she finishes her family and then goes for oophorectomy you can give her ocp until unless she want her second child when she is planning second child then you have to stop ocps so till then you can give her ocp there will be two advantages one she is having contraception second it is going to protect her from ovarian cancer right so how does the ocps protect from ovarian cancer ocps protect from ovarian cancer because they prevent ovulation and the important risk factor for ovarian cancer is ovulation itself okay so what are all the cancers which ocp protects ocp protects protects uh, what all protects us from what all cancers long term use of ocp protects us from which all cancers so ocp protects from ceo so ocp protects from colorectal cancer endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer ocp protects from colorectal cancer endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer okay all are true with regards to the intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis for group b streptococcus except so what happens is whenever we have group b streptococcus infection in the mother it can cause neonatal meningitis in the fetus so if mother has group b streptococcal infections it can cause neonatal meningitis it can cause neonatal meningitis so all are true with regard to intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis for gbs except so it is advised when parturient develops intrapartum pyrexia it is effective against both early onset and late onset neonatal gbs 
advice to women with gbs bacteria in the current pregnancy should be given to the women with previous baby affected with gbs disease even if the swab negative in the current pregnancy so uh, you have to always give when the mother develops intrapartum pyrexia because during labor if she has gone into pyrexia means definitely there might be group b streptococcus and uh, better to give so that you prevent the neonatal meningitis so you have to advise now when you are giving uh, intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis will it protect will it protect the mother from both early onset and late onset neonatal G gbs or will it protect only for early onset gbs so it is effective against only early onset gbs it is effective against only early onset gbs so b statement is wrong guys it doesn't protect from late onset so you have to advise intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis uh, with gbs bacteria in current pregnancy yes you should be giving to the woman with previous baby affected with gbs even the swab is negative in the current pregnancy all these are indications of intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis for gbs <coughs> so b is the wrong statement b is the wrong statement so what is the antibiotic which you give for group b streptococcus So, what is the antibiotic which you give for group B streptococcus prophylaxis? So, we give injection benzyl penicillin. Injection benzyl penicillin. Or you can give amoxicillin and ampicillin also. Okay. Uh, and you have to give 30 minutes before the onset of you have to give at the onset of labor not uh, whenever they come to you you have to give at the onset of labor next question a 28 year old amenorrheic woman who wishes to become pregnant attends the fertility clinic complaining of galactoria and mild visual disturbance her serum prolactin level was found to be elevated so here there is a woman a fertility clinic complaining of galactoria and mild visual disturbance her serum prolactin level was found to be elevated an mri scan of the head is performed which showed the presence of macroprolactinoma but without supracellular extension what is the most appropriate first line management so she is wishing to get pregnant also guys and she is having macroprolactinoma so when do you call macroprolactinoma when macroprolactinoma is when the pituitary tumor is more than 1 cm micro is less than 1 cm right the main triad of prolactinoma prolactinoma is indeed the most common or the uh, most common pituitary adenoma the triad symptoms which we have are amenorrhea galactoria and decreased libido or infertility so amenorrhea galactoria and decreased libido or infertility right so what is the first line management which you have to do for these patients uh, so as it doesn't have supracellular extension so uh, what you can do is first always try with medical management even for macroprolactinoma the first line is medical management itself if medical management fails then you will go for surgical management 
here what is the medical management which you want to give so again the medical management which i want to give here is as she is willing to get pregnant what do you want to give do you want to give uh, bromocriptin or uh, do you want to give cabergolin as she is willing to get pregnant i am going to prefer giving her bromocriptin yes excellent nana neat and jeet so we have to give d that is bromocriptin if she is not willing to be become pregnant then your answer would have gone to cabergolin so whenever you have prolactinoma <coughs> drug of choice is cabergolin itself but if they are willing for pregnancy then you have to give bromocriptin okay next patient with molar had evacuation at a how to see if the pessary is adequately inserted or not so when you have inserted the pessary for prolapse how do you know that whether the pessary which you have inserted is adequately inserted or not patient feels discomfort does not come out during voiding after valsella pessary does not come out one finger gap between vagina and the ring so patient will feel discomfort uh, no it does not come out during voiding so most important is uh, after valsalva also the pessary should not come out so how do you know that what the pessary which you have inserted is adequately inserted or not is after valsalva also pessary should not come out after the valsalva also the pessary should not come out right so this is the pessary so we call it as ring pessary so we have rubber pessary and we have pvc pessary we have rubber pessary and the pvc pessary right so this uh, pessary <coughs> the diameter of the pessary is equal to the diameter of pessary equal to the distance from lower border of pubic symphysis to posterior fornix so the distance from the lower border of pubic symphysis to posterior fornix so here only so the diameter of pessary is equal to uh, distance from pubic symphysis to posterior fornix okay so how do you know that you have inserted a correct size so after you, you should ask the patient to cough or laugh so when you ask the patient to cough or laugh it should not come out when you ask the patient to cough or laugh it should not come out that is one way another way is you ask the patient to strain it should not come out next patient should be able to void also after you have inserted the pessary patient should be able to void after you have inserted the pessary if patient is not able to void after you have inserted the pessary it means you have inserted too huge size because of which urethra is getting nipped because of which urethra is getting nipped between the pessary and the uh, pessary and the pubic symphysis so that is causing retention of the urine so the indications of the pessary is for a young woman who is planning a pregnancy during early pregnancy up to 18 weeks and puerperium so the indications for pessary are a young woman who is planning a pregnancy during early pregnancy up to 18 weeks and puerperium next temporary use by clearing the infection and decubitus ulcer 
a woman who is unfit for major surgery and in case a woman refuses for surgery so i am discussing about the pessary which is a conservative management for prolapse which is a conservative management for prolapse so the indications of inserting the ring pessary in a prolapse are when she is planning a pregnancy when you have a early pregnancy up to 18 weeks of pure perium so temporary use you can use till you clear the infection a woman who is unfit for surgery and a woman who refuses for surgery but pessary also has some limitations guys so the limitations of the pessary is it is always uh, palliative it's never curative you have to remove the pessary every 3 months you have to remove the pessary every 3 months and you have to keep a new pessary so this can cause all infections local infections vaginitis you know they'll have uncomfortable dyspareunia a forgotten pessary can lead to ulcer cancers and fistula ring pessary cannot cure stress incontinence there are different type of pessaries for stress incontinence there are different types of pessaries for stress incontinence okay next question a 30 year old para 2 living 2 has menorrhagia for 2 years she was ligated she was tubal ligated 4 years back on investigation she is found to have 2 into 2 cm submucous myoma what will be the best management option for this patient so her family is complete but she is young please understand she is young so is it a symptomatic fibroid or asymptomatic fibroid so is it a symptomatic or asymptomatic okay let's understand and try to solve this mcq first and foremost i'll tell you that this is a symptomatic fibroid so why am i calling this as symptomatic because she has menorrhagia and all right symptomatic fibroid now if you observe and family is complete family is complete but uh, age of the patient is she young or old guys 30 years she is young guys she is young but pretty fast her family is complete family is complete there is one option which i rule out straight now because family is complete that is hysteroscopic myoma resection so i rule out hysteroscopic myoma resection guys because myomectomy should be done only for who who what is the only indication for performing myomectomy so myomectomy should be performed only when they only when they have infertility if they don't have infertility you should not do myomectomy if they don't have infertility you should not do myomectomy right next in the medical management total abdominal hysterectomy danazol gnrh you have given do you want to really knock out the uterus at 30 years of age just for a sake of 2 cm fibroid to suffer this much small fibroid yeah for this you want to remove the uterus it's too unfair i feel so we will not go with total abdominal hysterectomy because she is young only 30 years and it's a small fibroid so you can go with the medical management among these two medical management which drug is better for reduce for reducing the size of the fibroid so the drug of choice which can help in the reduction of the size of the fibroid is gnrh analogs over danazol because gnr danazol has androgenic side effects okay but danazol and gnr analogs both can help in the reduction of the size of the fibroid so always in fibroid it depends the management depends on the case scenario age of the patient symptoms of the patient so it's not always same it's not always same okay
so we'll discuss some more mcqs guys any particular topic which you have, which you want to discuss which you want me to discuss so now uh, we'll start with the we'll go with some all co questions which tumor marker should be used to access the post menopausal ovarian risk which tumor marker should be used to access the postmenopausal ovarian risk right a very good question asked by kostub here that is uh, what is the cut off of uh, size of the fibroid for surgery there is no particular cut off of the size of fibroid for surgery and according to the recent guidelines <coughs> whatever might be the size of the fibroid if the patient does not have symptoms you can leave it leave her alone you can leave her alone okay so which is the most common ovarian tumor uh, which you expect in the post menopausal women which is the most common ovarian tumor in the post menopausal women Yes, Julie. I heard your. I there was some telepathy, so I opened ovarian tumors. <laughs> Very good. The most common uh, ovarian tumor in the postmenopausal woman is epithelial ovarian tumors, and among epithelial ovarian tumors, also the most common ovarian tumor is. among epithelial also the most common ovarian tumor is so most common epithelial ovarian tumor is serous cyst adenocarcinoma serous cyst adenocarcinoma so which tumor marker should be used to assess the postmenopausal ovarian risk ca125 ca125 okay right i think the most important uh, then solving mcqs is to take up of your queries guys so i have one more query here that is uh, to revise the kadar and romero principle <coughs> definitely definitely i also have an mcq on that so i think we have so uh, i've solved it in the recent time but it is important guys and it has come in the previous year questions also so i will uh, quickly revise the kadar and romero principle for you all so an important concept which i'm teaching you now is uh we are going to learn a short topic of pregnancy of unknown location we are going to learn a short topic of pregnancy of unknown location so what do you mean by pregnancy of unknown location so when you don't know where is the pregnancy whether it is in the uterus whether it is in the fallopian tube whether it is in the cervix whether it is in the abdomen but there is somewhere pregnancy then you call it as pregnancy of unknown location then you might ask how did i know that she she is pregnant so when upt is positive when upt is positive but you don't see the gestational sac but no gestational sac on tbs then you call it as pregnancy of unknown location so when upd is positive but no gestational sac on tbs you call it as pregnancy of unknown location so what should be your next step when you were you have pregnancy of unknown location you don't know where is the pregnancy right but upd is come positive 
सो वॉट शुड बी योर नेक्स्ट स्टेप हाउ कैन आई कन्फर्म रियली की हा इज इट अ प्रेगनेंसी और नॉट यू नो देर इज ऑल्सो समाइम्स येस वेरी गुड डॉक्टर कॉस्त सो यू हैव टू नेक्स्ट गो फॉर सीरम बीटा एच सी जी मेजरमेंट बिकॉज दैट विल गिव यू एक्सैक्ट दैट कैन डिटेक्ट इवन वेरी लेस अमाउंट ऑफ बीटा एच सी जी वेन सीरम बीटा एच सी जी इज मोर देन फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड इंटरनेशनल यूनिट्स पर लीटर यू शुड आइडियली सी द जस्टेशनल सैक सो प्रॉबली वेन यूर मेजर सीरम बीटा एच सी जी इट इज लेस देन फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड so that might be the reason why you are not seeing a gestational sac so what you should do when you are when beta hcg is less than 1500 you have to do serial beta hcg monitoring serial beta hcg monitoring every 48 hours so when you do serial beta hcg monitoring every 48 hours so when you do serial beta hcg monitoring every 48 hours if beta hcg increases by more than 66% so when you have repeated beta hcg after 48 hours so when you have repeated beta hcg after 48 hours and beta hcg has increased by more than 66% then it is a intra uterine pregnancy you have done a pretty early scan wait for another 1 to 2 weeks okay if the beta hcg is not right is rising rise is more than 50% but less than 66% then it is a ectopic pregnancy if there is a fall in beta hcg or rise is less than 50% then it is a failed pregnancy then it is a failed pregnancy or a missed abortion or a missed abortion understood uh, rajat so this is the this is the new concept of uh, uh, radar and uh, romero principle kadar and romero principle so this is according to the nice guidelines 2019 and you have to follow this now let's see one mcq here so the serum beta hcg of a symptomless woman with a pregnancy of unknown location has dropped by 50% after 48 hours what is the next step you advise what is the next step you advise so when there is a drop in beta hcg by more than 50% what is your diagnosis here abortion missed abortion right so there is it has it has got by itself vanished so you don't require to take any more effort right so what should be your next step it's a failed pregnancy right very good excellent rajat so what should be the management which you want to do ask her to submit a upt after 14 days if she stays asymptomatic discharge her home you don't admit her only to discharge okay repeat beta hcg after another 48 hours is there any point of repeating the beta hcg again after 48 hours when i already know it's a missed abortion so no point of repeating the beta hcg again why do you want to request cancer antigen here when i know it's a missed abortion why do you want to do an ultrasound scan will you will you see the sac if you do ultrasound scan 
so no point in doing ultrasound scan also so what is the best answer i have here ask her to submit the upt <coughs> after 14 days if she stays asymptomatic <coughs> understood guys So if you have any doubt you can feel free to ask here guys so i hope you understood all of you understood this question so we'll go back to our uh, oncology mcqs <coughs> right So now uh, we'll see some MCQs, guys. We'll see some MCQs on oncology. What is the current recommendation regarding screening for ovarian cancer in a woman with no family history of the disease? What is the current recommendation regarding screening for ovarian cancer in women with no family history of the disease? So when they don't have family history, do we screen for ovarian cancer? We don't perform any screening method. What is the only screening method which has, uh, uh, what is the only cancer which has screening method uh, which we go on doing screening? Routine screening. It is only for cervical cancer we do the routine screening. Do you, try, do you have any screening method for endometrial cancer? So you don't have any screening method for routine ovarian cancer. Only if they have BRCA mutation, then you will go for annual pelvic ultrasound scans as well as uh, annual pelvic examination and mammography. But if they don't have any BRCA mutation, I don't screen them for ovarian cancer. So for cervical cancer, we have the screening method that is where we use pap smear or LBC or we can do pap smear plus uh, or LBC plus HPV DNA co-testing plus HPV DNA co-testing right but we don't have anything for the uh, ovarian cancer do we have for endometrial cancer any routine screening method You don't have any screening method for endometrial cancers also. You don't have any screening method for endometrial cancers also, right? So next question. With regard to squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, what is the believed to be minimum time span between Infection by HPV and the development of pre-malignant lesions with the true malignant potential. So first and foremost, HPV infected cervical cells are called as HPV infected cervical cells are called as So BRCA mutation mainly causes breast and ovarian cancer. So for endometrial cancer also you don't have any routine screening. HPV infected cells are called as coilocytes guys. They are called coilocytes.
HPV infected cells are called coelocytes. So the coelocytes, the coelocytes will uh, again progress to CIN1, CIN2 and CIN3 and carcinoma in situ. So the coelocytes will progress into CIN1, CIN2, CIN3 and carcinoma in situ, right? So uh, coelocytes to CIN1 and CIN2 will take some months guys see hpv infection to cin1 and uh, cin2 will take some months on average 6 to 24 months from cin2 to 3 to invasive cancer takes around 10 to 15 years 10 to 15 years okay so what is the nearest answer here we have so true malignant potential means to CIN3 that is 9 years that is 9 years right so CIN1 is where you have dysplastic cells up till how much guys dysplastic cells are seen up to in lower one third of the epithelium in lower one third of the epithelium cervical epithelium CIN2, you will see dysplastic cells in lower two-third of the epithelium. CIN3, the dysplastic cells are seen in more than lower two-third. More than lower two-third. Entire epithelium, you will see dysplastic cells except breach the but there is no breach in the basement membrane what do you call that as entire epithelium there are uh, so it affects the entire epithelium but no breach in the basement membrane that is nothing but the carcinoma in situ carcinoma in situ if there is a breach in the basement membrane then it will go into cancer cervix if there is a breach then it is called as cancer cervix there's how much chance of cin1 regressing back to normal how much percentage of cin1 regresses back to normal how much percentage of cin2 regresses to back to normal and how much percentage of cin3 regresses back to normal Sixty percent of the CIN one will regress back to normal. Forty percent of CIN two will regress back to normal. Thirty percent of CIN three will regress back to normal. <coughs> Sixty, forty, thirty. So sixty percent of CIN one will regress back to normal. Forty percent of CIN two, and thirty percent of CIN three will regress back to normal. Okay. What is the principal role of radiotherapy in the treatment of endometrial cancer? So what is the main modality of treatment in the endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer and uh, cervical cancer will discuss. Just main modality, not pin to pin. What is the management? So, in uh, ovarian cancer, mainly what do you do? Is it radiotherapy or surgery or uh, chemotherapy? <coughs> so, in ovarian cancer, it is mainly surgery followed by <coughs> chemo. 
surgery followed by chemo. Whereas for uh, so we mainly do surgery followed by we give chemotherapy in ovarian cancer. Cervical cancer. We either go to surgery or we go for chemo, uh, radiotherapy. There is no much role of chemo in uh, cervical cancer. We do concurrent chemo radiotherapy. That is we give chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy. Right? Endometrial cancer. <coughs> so what do we do mainly in the endometrial cancer? So in endometrial cancer, it is surgery followed by radiotherapy we give. So it is a preferred treatment option in early stages. No, we don't prefer radiotherapy in early stages. We prefer surgery in early stages. Right? There is no place for radiotherapy in the treatment. No, we give radiotherapy. Indeed, we give radiotherapy to all stages of endometrial cancer except 1A. So, radiotherapy is not required only for 1A, grade 1 and grade 2. The rest of all stages we give post-op radiotherapy guys. So, pre-operatively, no, we give post-operatively. This is wrong. Post-operatively to sensitize any remaining disease. We don't give any chemo. We don't give chemo. So, we do surgery and post-operatively post we give radiotherapy as adjunctive. So, the B is the answer here. B is the answer here. So, post-operatively you use radiotherapy only as an adjunctive therapy in the endometrial cancer. Okay. So, I hope uh, you have learnt uh, some learnt good questions and answers in today's session and I hope the session was beneficial to all of you. So any doubts before I end today's session or any question or anything which you want to ask uh, or any topic which you want to ask or which you are confused which you want me to teach please feel free to tell so that I can uh, discuss before we end today's session. Yes, Rajat. Any other uh, query? So, how is all? How is your preparation going on? I hope you are reading well. How is your health? So, any other topic you want to know? Okay, now at 9 p.m. you can again join back to with me at 9 p.m. guys. At 9 p.m. again we have uh, what do you say? On Anacademy app, special class guys. On Anacademy app, I have a special class. So special class may we will be discussing the PYQs. I am discussing PYQs. So this series I am uh, I am already I have already started and I have started it with uh, uh, first to 2020 we have started and then we have finished 2019 and we have gone into the 2018. So currently we are discussing the 2018 question paper. So feel free to join because it's an absolutely free class. So you can all join on the Unacademy app. So that is again a good experience. So I'll see you all at 9 p.m. guys. I'll see you all at 9 p.m. Thank you guys. Have a good day.